हेलो क्लास वेलकम टू कनेक्ट एड इन टूडेज क्लास वी विल बी रीडिंग द स्टोरी टाइटल कैठमंडू बाय विक्रम सेठ कैठमंडू इज एन एक्सर्ट फ्रॉम विक्रम सेठ बुक हेवन लेक दैट पोट्रेस हिज एनकाउंटर्स विथ हिज विजिट टू द कैपिटल सिटी ऑफ नेपाल कैठमंडू इन हिज बुक ही डिपिक्स हिज लॉन्ग एक्सकर्शन फ्रॉम चाइना टू इंडिया बाय गेटिंग थ्रू टिबेट एंड नेपाल This travel log gives an understanding of his excursion to Kathmandu and how he feels about visiting the city. By the end of this chapter, you will have a better understanding of storytelling and learn new words. You may also gain better knowledge of the English language. Now students, read out the chapter loudly with me. I shall assist you if you get stuck anywhere. Let's begin reading the chapter. I get a cheap room in the center of town and sleep for hours. The next morning with Mr. Shah's son and nephew, I visit the two temples in Kathmandu that are most sacred to Hindus and Buddhists. At Pashupati Nath, outside which a sign proclaims entrance for the Hindus only, there is an atmosphere of febrile confusion. Priests, hawkers, devotees, tourists, cows, monkeys, pigeons and dogs roam through the grounds. We offer a few flowers. There are so many worshippers that some people trying to get the priest's attention are elbowed aside by others pushing their way to the front. A princess of the Nepalese royal house appears. Everyone bows and makes way. By the main gate, a party of saffron-clad westerners struggle for permission to enter. The policeman is not convinced that they are the Hindus. Only Hindus are allowed to enter the temple. A fight breaks out between two monkeys. One chases the other, who jumps onto a Shiva linga, then runs screaming around the temples and down to the river, the holy Bagmati that flows below. A corpse is being cremated on its banks. Washerwomen are at their work and children bathe. From a balcony, a basket of flowers and leaves Old offerings now wilted is dropped into the river. A small shrine half protrudes from the stone platform on the river bank. When it emerges fully, the goddess inside will escape and the evil period of the Kali Yuga will end on earth. Good. Vikram took a cheap affordable hotel room on rent and as he was tired from the journey, he slept for a few hours. The next morning he visited two temples in Kathmandu along with Mr Shah's son and nephew. One of the temples was a pilgrimage for Hindus and the other one for Buddhists. Outside the Pashupati Nath temple a board was hung which read that entry into the temple was restricted to Hindus only. There was chaos outside the temple as priests, hawkers, devotees, tourists and various animals moved around. The writer and his friends offered a few flowers in the temple. There was a huge rush of pilgrims and they were elbowing each other in order to move ahead and reach the priest. As a royal princess appeared, everyone got aside to give way and bowed to her. At the main entrance, a group of foreigners who were dressed up in saffron color clothes like sadhus were trying to gain entry into the temple. The guard denied entry as he knew that they were not Hindus. Then he saw two monkeys fighting and one chased the other who jumped onto a shivaling then ran around the temple and finally reached the banks of the holy bagmati river which flows next to the temple there he saw a dead body being cremated washerwomen washing clothes and children bathing in the river the writer noticed how the river was being polluted when a basket of dry withered flowers was thrown into it from the balcony of a building a small temple protruded from the platform on the river bank it is said that when the temple would emerge completely Then the goddess in it would come out and the time period of the Kali Yuga would thus be ended by her. Moving on to the next para. At the Bodhnath Stupa, the Buddhist shrine of Kathmandu, there is in contrast a sense of stillness. Its immense white dome is ringed by a road. Small shops stand on its outer edge. Many of these are owned by Tibetan immigrants. Felt bags, Tibetan prints and silver jewelry can be bought here. There are no crowds. 
This is a haven of quietness in the busy streets around. Kathmandu is vivid, mercenary, religious with small shrines to flower adorned deities along the narrowest and busiest streets with fruit sellers, flute sellers, hawkers of postcards, shops selling western cosmetics, film rolls and chocolate or copper utensils and Nepalese antiques. Film songs blare out from the radios. Car horns sound, bicycle bells ring, stray cows low questioningly at motorcycles, vendors shout out their wares. I indulge myself mindlessly. Buy a bar of marzipan, a corn on the cob roasted in a charcoal brazier on the pavement, rubbed with salt, chili powder and lemon, a couple of love story comics and even a reader's digest. All this I wash down with Coca-Cola and a nauseating orange drink and feel much the better for it. Good. Then the writer describes the Bodhna temple which is a holy place for Buddhists. The place had a feeling of calmness. There was a huge white colored dome circumscribed by a road. There was a Tibetan market on the edge of the road where immigrants from Tibet had out shops selling felt bags, printed dresses and silver jewelry. There were no crowds and contrary to the scene at the Pashupatina temple, the Bodhna temple was calm and quiet with busy streets surrounding it. The writer describes Kathmandu, the city that has many different things to offer. It is a business hub, has religious places with many shrines, deities decorated with flowers on the narrow busy streets. There are hawkers selling fruits, flutes, postcards for the tourists. You can find many shops selling imported cosmetics film rolls which were used in the old cameras, chocolates, copper utensils and Nepalese antiques. Many different sounds can be heard like music from the radio, car horn, bicycle bells, moo sound of the cows and screaming vendors selling their wares. The writer bought a bar of marzipan, corn on the cob which had been roasted on charcoal fire by a roadside vendor. He had garnished it with lemon juice, salt and chili powder. He also bought some love story comics and a Reader's Digest magazine too. After eating all the things, he drank Coca-Cola, which is an aerated drink, and would help him digest the food easily. Proceeding to the para I consider what route I should take back home. If I were propelled by enthusiasm for travel per se, I would go by bus and train to Patna, then sail up to the Ganges, past Banaras to Allahabad, then up the Yamuna, past Agra to Delhi. But I am too exhausted and homesick. Today is the last day of August. Go home, I tell myself. Move directly towards home. I enter a Nepal Airlines office and buy a ticket for tomorrow's flight. Good. He thought of taking an adventurous route back home. It would be a bus or train journey till Patna. From there, he would sail in a boat on the Ganga River and cross Banaras to reach Allahabad. From Allahabad, he would sail upon the Yamuna River, cross Agra and reach Delhi. He gave up this adventurous trip and decided to take a flight from Kathmandu to New Delhi as he was exhausted. He purchased a ticket from the Nepal Airlines office for the next day's flight. Continuing. I look at the flute seller standing in a corner of the square near the hotel. In his hand is a pole with an attachment at the top from which 50 or 60 bansuris protrude in all directions like the quills of a porcupine. They are of bamboo. There are cross flutes and recorders. From time to time he stands the pole on the ground, selects a flute and plays for a few minutes. The sound rises clearly above the noise of the traffic and the hawker's cries. He plays slowly, meditatively, without excessive display. He does not shout out his wares. Occasionally, he makes a sale, but in a curiously off-handed way, as if this were incidental to his enterprise. Sometimes he breaks off playing to talk to the fruit seller. 
I imagine that this has been the pattern of his life for years. Good. The writer saw a flute seller selling different bansuris. He was different from other hawkers. He was standing in a corner of the square outside the hotel. He was holding a pole that had an attachment on top of it. There were 50 to 60 flutes stuck in it. It resembled the thorny body of a porcupine. There were flutes made of bamboo and also cross flutes and recorders. The man would keep the pole on the ground and would play different flutes for short durations. He was calm, only the music of the flute could be heard. He played it meditatively and was not anxious to attract attention. At times, he sold one flute but did not seem too interested to have a good sale. He would take breaks to talk to the fruit seller standing next to him. It seemed that this had been his routine for many years. Proceeding I find it difficult to tear myself away from the square. Flute music always does this to me. It is at once the most universal and most particular of sounds. There is no culture that does not have its flute. The reed ne, the recorder, the Japanese shakuhachi, the deep bansuri of Hindustani classical music, the clear or breathy flutes of South America, the high-pitched Chinese flutes. Each has its specific fingering and compass. It weaves its own associations. Yet to hear any flute is, it seems to me, to be drawn into the commonality of all mankind, to be moved by music closest in its phrases and sentences to the human voice. Its motive force too is living breath. It too needs to pause and breathe before it can go on. That I can be so affected by a few familiar phrases on the Bansuri surprises me at first. For on the previous occasions that I have returned home after a long absence abroad, I have hardly noticed such details and certainly have not invested them with the significance I now do. Good! The music of the flute enchanted Vikram and he could not go away from there. He finds flute music to be the most universal sounds. Flutes are played in many regions and have different names and varieties like the shakuhachi in Japan, the deep bansuri of Hindustani classical music, the clear breathy flutes in South America and the high pitched flutes in China. Each flute has a different way to play it and the sound varies in pitch and depth. The sound that emerges out of a flute is the most common sound, that is, the sound of the human voice. As the bansuri is played by the mouth, the player exhales into the flute to produce music and when he pauses to take a breath, the music of the flute also stops. He is surprised that he is deeply influenced by the sounds of the bansuri. Never before has he noticed something in such depth as he noticed the flute seller and his wares. Ok class. Now that we have learnt all these new words, let's use them in some sentences now. I shall show you some sample sentences now. Later on, make your own sentences with these words and show them to your teacher. Children, now that the chapter is finished, let's look at some fun exercises now. You have 4 minutes to try these questions out.
excellent answer students now let's match your answers with the answer sheet Now try to answer these personal questions on your own. Remember students there can be many correct answers. Okay students I hope you were able to understand the story about the beautiful city of Kathmandu Now let's move on to an amazing poem titled A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal by William Wordsworth This is one of the Lucy poems written by William Wordsworth These poems have been dedicated to his beloved The poet refers to death which is a permanent sleep The poet did not realize when his beloved Lucy slept forever that is she died he had taken life for granted and realized this harsh truth of life after her death now students read out the poem loudly with me i shall assist you if you get stuck anywhere let's begin reading the poem now a slumber did my spirit seal i had no human fears She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years no motion has she now no force she neither hears nor sees rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees good let's understand what the poet implies by these lines the poet's soul had drifted into deep sleep as he did not have any realization of the truth He had taken life for granted and had never thought that one day death would take Lucy away from him. When she was taken away, he could not bear the loss. The poet accepts the truth that Lucy is no more. She is motionless, lifeless. She cannot see nor hear. She has been buried in the earth. She will assimilate into the earth and is rotating along with the earth. One day she will become one with the rocks. stones and trees that are a part of the earth Okay class now that we have learned all these new words let's use them in some sentences now I shall show you some sample sentences now later on make your own sentences with these words and show them to your teacher Children, now that the chapter is finished, let's look at some fun exercises now. You have 3 minutes to try these questions out.
excellent answer students now let's match your answers with the answer sheet Now let's read another poem titled Fear No More by William Shakespeare. The poem does not portray death as misery or gloom as we traditionally believe. Instead, he considers it the ultimate destination of every human being. It brings peace for the humans from worldly problems and sorrows. Let's begin with the first stanza. Fear no more the heat o' the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone, and ta'en thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. Well done. In the first stanza, the poet says that once a person dies, he fears neither heat of the sun nor the chilling cold of winter season. After his death, a person's worldly tasks, which he does in life, are also done. His home is gone and his wages are taken away. In the fourth line, the poet says that like the poor chimney sweepers, the golden lads and girls, rich people also have to come to dust. That is die one day because death does not discriminate on the basis of one's wealth. For death, all humans are alike. O means or, thou means you, thy means your, hast means has, art means are, tain means taken. Fear no more the frown o'er the great thou art past the tyrant's stroke care no more to clothe and eat to thee the reed is as the oak the scepter learning physique must all follow this and come to dust good according to the poet after his death a person does not have to fear the angry face of his master he has also gone far away from the punishment of the fierce king A dead person does not care about the clothes to wear or food to eat. For him, there is no difference between grass which is soft and an oak tree which is hard. In other words, for a dead person, nothing has any value. Be it a strong tree like oak or soft grass like reed. In the fourth line, the poet says that every person has to die, though he may be a scepter or a learner or a physicist. Every person has to face death. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all dreaded thunder stone. Fear not slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. Good. A dead person does not fear from the lightning flash or terrible thunders in the sky. He does not fear from false allegations or criticism behind his back. A dead person is done with joy and sorrow. All the young lovers have to follow the tradition of those who are under the soil. That is, they also have to die one day. children now that the chapter is finished let's look at some fun exercises now you have 2 minutes to try these questions out
excellent answer students now let's match your answers with the answer sheet So that's it for today's class. Thank you and hope you all had fun learning.